Hello there. So uh, for, for the end of the event, let's discuss one topic which has been uh, quite much beaten over the three days, VXLAN, and what is happening uh, with that. So uh, just and, uh, a small nit to other fellow presenters, please, please be careful with your spelling. That abbreviation is all for capital letters, not in other way. So the history of VXLAN. Uh, it was a successful accident, in fact. Uh, around a decade ago, uh, one particular vendor uh, was working on a particular family of the products, and uh, they had uh, some set of requirements uh, to be able to carry Ethernet frames uh, over uh, IP transport. So uh, it was designed with certain tradebacks, knowing that this is not a universally applicable solution. Uh, it was not part of the IETF uh, working group process. Eventually, it came to the ITF as an individual submission and was uh, mostly there for documentation purposes. Uh, and uh, it actually took the world by surprise. Uh, it was simple enough, uh, and uh, to this day, it is the most popular uh, encapsulator for carrying uh, general layer to payload over IP. However, uh, that encapsulator is starting to show off its limitations. And the limitations are three large families. One thing is uh, there's no possibility to indicate uh, the type of the payload. Whatever gets in into the tunnel at the other end is received as is without any indication. Uh, there is no way to indicate that uh, the packet which is being sent is not the actual client packet, but something else. And uh, the worst of those, uh, which would be able to solve those two problems, is that there is no extensibility in the protocol itself. So the protocol identifier. <clears throat> It is assumed that what is carried over the VXLAN tunnel is an Ethernet payload. And if you need uh, to have a further demultiplexing, uh, you need to carry uh, the protocol identifier in the payload uh, Ethernet address. Or use some other uh, internal encapsulator within that in order to be able to demultiplex that. Certainly that can work. Uh, that's uh, not the easiest uh, or, or say the most flexible way to do that. Now, uh, uh, one possible solution which is used in practice is to run parallel tunnels. And that certainly works. And the namespace for the VNI identifiers is sufficiently large enough. However, there is another practical problem. The cost of the tunnel itself as, as an entity on the element is far bigger. And that is a far bigger practical problem than the perceived uh, uh, depletion of the uh, VNI identifiers. Uh, Non-client payload, there's no ability to send out uh, a, a packet, a frame, which does not belong to the client. And there's no, consequently, there's no ability at the other end uh, for the client to distinguish uh, that this packet is actually not a client packet, but something else. And this basically rules out a majority of the traditional OAM mechanisms which we are uh, familiar with. For example, running BFD over VXLAN tunnel is definitely non-trivial. Uh, there are workarounds uh, of doing that. But if we, if we want to compare that to equivalent of the MPLS uh, equivalent solutions, that's just nowhere near. Uh, and all sorts of uh, OAM and non-client payloads, they assume that the client is aware of that and cooperates. So if you have um, a scenario where you want to validate the uh, liveness of VXLAN tunnel, uh, this assumes that the uh, client itself needs, needs to be aware of that BFD session. It's not, a, not necessary enough to terminate a BFD session only on the network element itself. Uh, the XLAN is not just not extensible. All of the fields, all of the values in the fields, they are predefined. And uh, if we are talking about the interoperable extensibility, it is just not possible. Uh, this results in uh, various proprietary extensions. Yes, such things do exist. And uh, we certainly cannot talk about uh, multi-vendor interoperability in this environment. It was becoming evident that uh, such type of encapsulators, they are popular, they are solving practical problems, and therefore uh, industry overall needs a more flexible and interoperable solution. Uh, ITF started uh, a dedicated working group, Network Virtualization Overlays Over Layer 3, uh, around 2012 timeframe. And uh, 
the major requirements uh, put up front that group were uh, to develop a uh, similar or equivalent encapsulator which had uh, the extensibility, multi-vendor extensibility, which would be hardware friendly. Uh, again, we are talking not only about the software implementations, which are easy, uh, but we are talking about the hardware-only implementations uh, for which uh, var variable length structures and uh, all sorts of field manipulation are really costly. Uh, there were concerns being raised about uh, the lack or the complete lack of security aspects in uh, VXLAN. Uh, so, and also ability to implement that in practical terms uh, by the majority of the vendors, not only a uh, selected few. And what resulted? There were a multitude of proposals. Uh, three main ones, Genev, uh, this is actually not uh, an abbreviation, this is the name of a protocol. Uh, GUE, generic UDP uh, encapsulation, and uh, direct and semi-backwards compatible extension to VXLAN, the, the VXLAN generic protocol extensions. Uh, GUE was perceived to be too complex. It's a flexible one. Uh, it provides a lot of functionality, but uh, to implement at all in hardware was seen to be too complex. And uh, the backwards compatibility nature of GPE was seen to be too limiting uh, for this protocol to be a future proof. There were some niche protocols and proposals. And they did not advance too far. So Genev was seen as a compromise between the extensibility and the ability to implement that uh, in well, practical systems. So today, if we are looking from an ITF perspective, uh, the direct successor to the VXLAN is Genev. <clears throat> what that protocol is uh, and what it does, uh, it's an extensible uh, encapsulator able to carry uh, different types of payload even at the same tunnel. It has ability to signal that uh, uh, some payload being carried does not belong to the actual client. This is a service payload. Uh, it has ability to uh, do integrity check on the header itself. Uh, this is to um, limit, uh, limit out the possible attacks of injecting uh, stray Genev packets into the network. It has ability to encrypt the payload if that is considered to be needed. And it, it allows uh, roughly for 250 uh, bytes of vendor extensibility space uh, and does that in a manner which is interoperable with, uh, among the vendors. Simply uses the uh, vendor's PCI identifier uh, to indicate vendor-specific extensions. So it looks like uh, VXLAN is just a better VXLAN. So what is important if you are designing uh, an, a new, especially new environment which uses these types of encapsulators? Uh, if OAM and interoperability is important, VXLAN is just not an option. Uh, this doesn't mean that VXLAN is completely unusable and broken. If you are in a single vendor environment and you are happy uh, with uh, rather limited ability of OEM tools, that's definitely fine. If you are looking into something more complex and more future-proof, uh, Genev is uh, uh, the right way uh, to continue. The current state of the industry is that majority of the relevant component vendors do have either shipping or sampling support of uh, Genev in their products. Uh, system vendors are getting there. Uh, it's uh, uh, some iron trials, some iron prototypes. And uh, what is mostly now uh, needed and required from the community is to start looking from a design perspective. Uh, if, you are, if you are looking into the overlay type of a designs, uh, seriously consider VXLAN as being obsolete. Um, this is only about the data plane. No changes in the control plane, so your favorite VPN or, or whatnot you are using stays exactly the same. Uh, the only change is that the encapsulator used for tunneling your payload is now different. That's it from my side. Thank you.